This is something that happened to me five or so years ago. I was fresh out of university with my degree in international development. I wanted to help underserved communities develop meaningful projects and see more of the world. I was young. I was naive. Eager to get started, I took one of the first jobs that offered me a position. It wasn't something I necessarily wanted to do, but it was adjacent to my interests and, more importantly, took me to a place I'd never seen before. I loved everything when I arrived. It was beautiful, sunny, and green. My new co-workers, all local staff, were amazing and so kind. My boss invited me to play soccer on Sundays with his family. My fellow project coordinator would go out dancing with me on the weekends. My roommate, a fellow expat working in development as well, was a fun and spunky woman I adored. I felt so blessed. Then, one day, it changed. I was walking downtown with a friend. There was a vegetable and fruit market that had great fresh produce directly from the farmers growing it. It was about a 20 minute bus ride from my apartment, so not close, but not incredibly far either. My friend and I loaded up and began walking over to a quiet corner to call a cab to help us haul our goods back. Then I heard it. Hey, hey miss and the guy recited my exact address. It took me to a second to realize he was shouting my address. I turned around to see a man hanging out of his car, slowly crawling along the road with us. My friend recognized my address too. She turned to me and asked, Do you know him? I'd never seen him before. He kept shouting, Yeah, you. You're living in the back house on the second floor, right? That made it even worse. I lived on a big suburban lot with two houses, one in the front where my landlady and her family lived, and the second in the back. The second house was split into two apartments. The bottom floor housed two students, while I lived on the second floor with my roommate. You couldn't see the second house from the road, much less the stairway that led to the second floor. My heart was pounding. I wanted to shout back at the guy, but I was scared. I was a 22-year-old woman living in a foreign country, and I didn't want to draw attention. I didn't know how people would react. I didn't know how he would react. So we walked. My friend tried to comfort me, saying that maybe he knew my landlady's family. I was probably the only redhead in the whole country. He could be my neighbor I hadn't met. The encounter didn't leave me. It stayed in my mind. A week or so passed and I stopped glancing behind my back whenever a car drove by. I started to feel secure. Then he showed up again. I was walking home from work. It was getting dark. My office was a 15 to 20 minute stroll from my apartment, perfect as a quick way to stretch my legs. I was halfway home when I felt someone watching me. Then, the slow crawl of a car sidling up beside me. I knew it was him without looking. He recited my address while leaning out of his window, one hand on the wheel. Why are you shy? He asked. I ignored him and kept walking. There was no one around. It was getting dark. Come on. He cajoled. Let me give you a ride. I know where you live. Not reassuring. I started to feel my chest tighten. I wanted to call someone but I didn't know what he'd do if I reached for my phone. I was practically jogging now, but he just sped up to match my pace. Listen, bitch. And now he was angry, his voice hard. You don't just ignore a man like that. I wondered what he'd do if he stopped the car. He looked fit and young. He could probably catch me. He could hurt me. So I did something that, in retrospect, seemed absolutely bizarre. I yelled at him, wildly, rapidly. I did it in my first language, not what they spoke in this country, not a language he would have ever heard, probably. I screamed curse words and threats, anything I could think of. I'll never forget the confused fury on his face, but he did slow down, letting me run ahead. I could see a woman at a bus stop at the intersection ahead, if I got to her, maybe she'd help. Maybe he'd get scared off. 
By the time I got to the woman, he was gone. I kept walking home, looking behind me with every step. I told my roommate about what had happened. She told me not to bother reporting it to the police since they were corrupt and wouldn't do anything. When I told my boss, he told me the same. He said he had a baseball bat and would come whenever I called. I saw the man again two weeks later. He was sitting in his car, parked in front of the gates to my apartment. I had been about to take the trash out, but retreated before he could see me. I told my landlady, and when she went over to confront him, he drove off. This continued for weeks. Not every day, but once or twice a week. He was always there, waiting. I took cabs to and from work. I never traveled alone. I barely slept waiting for him to break in and kill me. My last weekend abroad, he almost did. I went out drinking with a group of my friends, four of us in total. We were celebrating the end of my contract, and I was happy to go home in a few days. I couldn't wait to see my family. I couldn't wait to put an ocean between me and the man. We had beers at a local bar, a five to ten minute walk max from my apartment. When it started to get late, Around one, we tried to get a cab, but it was impossible. The roads were jammed and people were everywhere outside. Cabs couldn't even get to us. So, we thought, even though others warned us not to, let's walk home. It would be faster than calling a cab. We'll be fine. We're a group of four. No one will hassle us. We got halfway there when we had to cross a main road. There were no street lights not that kind of place. The road was absolutely empty, not a single car in sight. We crossed the road. A few more minutes, but then we were backlit with the bright headlights of a car coming up. We glanced back. A cop car, two men in the front, and I knew, even though I couldn't see from the bright lights in my eyes, he was driving. He was a fucking cop. The jeep slowed, as I knew it would. He rolled down the window to draw. Hey, miss. Reciting my address. Nice night, yeah? My friends immediately knew who he was. I could see how nervous they were. We were alone on a dark, empty street in the middle of the night. They were cops, so they were armed. No one would intervene, probably. It was too dangerous. You girls need a ride, he leered. His friend, who I could see now, was grinning hugely. My last few days, I thought, and this is how it ends. We sped up our pace. I don't know what our plan was other than to get away. Then I heard one of the doors of the jeep open as the passenger jumped out. I don't think I've ever been so scared in my life, although I didn't dare turn back to see. We were at the turn to my street now, two minutes more to get to safety. The car was right behind us. Whoever had gotten out of the car was right behind us. Two of my friends were now ahead, while another clutched my hand and dragged me along. Then, out of nowhere, another car appeared. They were coming from the opposite direction, illuminating us all. When they slowed to see what was going on, I've never been so grateful. It was an older couple, and they looked concerned. I think they knew something very bad was about to happen. I heard, not saw, the car door swing open. I almost got hit as they sped past us in a hurry. The other car stayed, watching. They offered to escort us home, driving alongside just in case, but I knew he wouldn't come back. Not tonight. I still took a cab with my friends to their place for the night. We took my roommate with us, just in case. Nothing happened after that. My last two days were uneventful, although I couldn't shake the feeling that he might show up at any given moment. Driving to the airport, all packed up and ready to go home, my cab got pulled over by a cop. My stomach dropped. I couldn't breathe. It wasn't him although it could have been. It wasn't until I got on the plane, until I landed in my home country, that I finally felt that terror leave me. 
I still get nervous when cars drive up behind me, when men roll down their windows to shout at me. It's never him, but still, you never know. It's roughly 9 on a Saturday evening. I'm sat in the passenger seat of an armed response vehicle, driving around a problem estate in the north of my city. In the driver's seat is Adam, a close friend and experienced firearms officer with seven years on the unit. All is well at this moment. So far we have seized a stolen moped that we stumbled upon in the same estate, and have also attended a road traffic collision, in which we applied aid to the driver until paramedics arrived. All patrols, all patrols, from control, stay safe, stay safe, the area of Orchard Road, due to an active firearms deployment, the radio beams into life with that message. At this moment, we are prepared to be called up and immediately begin discussing options for gear and tactics. All right, if we pull up here and gear up, I'll grab my conventional, and if you go conventional and baton round, Adam asks me, yeah mate. Pull up here and we can start getting kitted, I replied. We pulled up into a nearby car park that was virtually empty and began to gear up. At that moment, the radio came to life again. TFC, TFC, all hotel units. Can I have you moving to the area of Orchard Road, please? Switch to TAC Ops 1 for brief. We are at this point sat in our cars listening to the brief. We switch our radios over to TAC Ops 1 channel and wait. There is silence. TFC, TFC, all hotel units and channel call up by call sign. The tactical firearms commander calls up, breaking the silence. Following this, units begin to call up. Five others in total, along with a dog van. Hotel Sierra 3-1, I called into the radio. All hotel units from the TFC. This job pertains to multiple logs between 2030 and 2045 hours, regarding an address in Orchard Road. The informants state loud screams and bangs consistent with an assault or fight are audible from the address. At 2050, three response assets requested assistance, claiming there to be a subject inside of the address with another person making threats to officers, themselves, and the other subject. At the present moment in time, 2104, I'll be authorizing a firearms authority. Hotel Romeo 72, I'll be declaring yourself the operational firearms commander. So far. So far, he replied. Received. Unit straight to scene deployment, please. TFC out, 2106. Adam and I now began kitting up, both selecting to take our G36 carbines, while I also brought a less than lethal AEP launcher along as a precaution. Within minutes, we are racing to the scene seven miles away. As we near to the property around a mile away, we bump into one of the ARVs, the radio has remained quiet while we have been responding. We pulled up to the property. Police vehicles lined the streets, with officers visible at the front of the premises. Cordons have already been erected around the street, and the dog van is already on scene, with the handler at the front door. 3-1, we're state 5, I said onto the channel, letting them know we had arrived. We pulled up onto the curb. I stepped out, quickly being approached by a response officer who began to brief me on the situation. Hello, mate. We've got two females inside of the premises that we know of, one of which is holding the other one hostage. She's barricaded them in and is making threats to us and the hostage. The dog handler has been putting challenges in. Unfortunately, no progress has been made as of yet, he said to me. Right, okay. Have we got containment with tasers and knowledge of anybody else inside? I replied to him. Yeah, we've got taser officers on the back and front door. We've checked, and there are no other methods of escape, unless she feels like jumping out of a window. And they're covered too. And we've not seen anybody or heard anybody mentioned, so we're unsure right now, he said. Adam and the two firearms officers from the other vehicle now joined us, as we stood beside our ARV being briefed. I turned around, facing the other firearms officers, asking them, You lads hear all that? Each replied yes via nods and words to the effect of that. Okay, what do we think? Contain and call out, maybe try and get a negotiator. 
I asked them. Well, if we try and get negotiations going now, obviously if this escalates, we'll go for an emergency search. One of the officers chimed in. Yeah, I agree with that, I commented, as the remainder of the officers also added their approval in. Right, let's go in, gents. We've still got about four ARVs towards anyways, so we can update them. But let's sort ourselves out, I now said. All right, I'll update control if you lads want to go up, Adam replied. I now walked up to the front of the house, followed by the two firearms officers. About eight officers were positioned around the front, two with their tasers drawn, while the dog handler stood holding his dog, ready to deploy him. The other officers were positioned in cover, with one attempting to speak to the subject. Hello, we're already briefed. If none of the TTOs want to get back for us, please. Four of the officers, minus the two officers with taser, dog handler, and the officer attempting to speak to the subject, now walked back from the front, allowing us space. I now peek through the window, seeing an open door that led to a well-lit kitchen, in the doorway of which were two figures, who I could identify to be about five foot roughly, one of which had its arms around the front of the other, and an object in front of their throat, S and V. The rest of the house minus the kitchen was pitch black, and I could hear whimpers and crying clearly coming from the person with something to their neck through the open window. I raised my carbine to an off-aim ready position. Contact two subjects. I now said, telling the other officers I could see the pair. A snap was audible behind me as I heard one of the officers preparing his baton launcher. The other was peeking further to my right, with his taser drawn in his right hand. Armed police, stay exactly there. Get your hands up now. I said loudly through to the pair. S reached across to the right, switched on a light, at which point the room I was looking through I believed to be the living room, lit up. I could now see a knife across V's throat. Oh, knife. Drop the fucking knife now. I screamed at S now, raising my rifle at the pair. I'll chop her if you come in here, you fucking rat. Fuck off out of it, S replied. Drop the knife now, armed police officers. The officer to my right now shouted at her. Drop it. Drop it now. I repeated towards her. Adam had rushed up to us at this moment, holding an enforcer. Hotel Romeo 49 to TFC, one of the other officers called into the radio. Go ahead, 49. The TFC replied. Yes, yes. Currently a containment and call out. Two occupants, one with a knife. If we can have negotiations officer towards please, and an ETA on further ARVs. 49 received from TFC. All ARVs are within a five-minute ETA at this moment in time. I'll attempt to source a negotiations officer, the TFC replied. Yes, yes, many thanks, the officer now said, ending the exchange. At this moment, another ARV pulled up, as three ARVOs, one of which being the OFC, got out and approached us. Sit rep, the OFC said. Two occupants, one with a knife, one believed to be a victim. Threats made to occupants and officers. Negotiations should be on way. Light challenges in place so far. All right, let's try comms with them. Prepare for an emergency search. While this was going on, I still had the pair in my sights. My carbine still trained on S. Can we get a shield on this side to cover us? And maybe one with long arm, one with launcher, and the shield guy with sidearm or something, I suggested. Yeah, good shout. Officer, go grab me a shield, mate. Officer 2, if you want to move to the right side with a crayon and cover with a launcher. One officer ran back to his ARV to retrieve a shield. Meanwhile, the second officer moved over to my right shoulder, now raising his AEP launcher at the pair. Drop the knife now and you'll come to no harm. I now said to S. I'll fucking do all of yous. Fuck off, you rats. S replied. It doesn't need to be like this. Just drop the knife. I'm not coming out. Fuck off home. S now screamed, growing more agitated. We're gonna need to move, I said to the UFC. Alright, let's get the door in. We'll go for a victim-led emergency search, lads. Everybody good with that, the UFC said. 
One by one, we each agreed that we were happy with it. OFC, TFC, the OFC now called into the radio. Go ahead, the TFC replied. Yes, yes, we're gonna make entry for a victim-led emergency search. Can you get some assets from the AMBO to stage and standby, please? Yes, that's received, the TFC replied, ending the interaction. All right, let's get that shield on the door and get ready. The final two ARVs arrived, containing two ARVOs each. They quickly moved up to the front door. All right, two persons inside, one with a knife, one believed to be a hostage. Threats have been made to officers and the subject. We're going for a victim-led emergency search, another officer said, informing the four new arrivals. Right, let's get the enforcer up and use the dog to our advantage, the OFC said. Adam positioned himself to the left of the door, ready to use the enforcer. Meanwhile, the shield officer beside me and the officer with the launcher repositioned to the front door. I repositioned behind him, still holding my rifle. Behind me was an officer with a taser, and behind him was an officer with a lethal option. Another officer with a launcher moved to the window we were previously stationed on and continued to hold cover on them. Meanwhile, Another officer stood to the side of the door, ready to deploy the stun grenades. Adam slammed the enforcer into the door repeatedly. As he did this, the door appeared to begin to give way. Armed police! Armed police! The shield officer shouted as the door continued to be hammered on. The door swung inwards violently as it had been hit to breaking point. Door, Adam said, indicating to anybody who may not be looking that the door was now in. He then dropped the enforcer and moved onto the back of the stack, unholstering his sidearm. Armed police! Armed police! Any persons inside of the premises, show us your hands! The shield officer shouted as we moved into the doorway. The OFC and four other officers joined the stack as we did this. Two officers broke off to the left, holding at the bottom of the stairs. Meanwhile, another officer moved to the very bottom of the stairs, covering them while the shield officer moved into the doorway of the room I'd been looking through. Contact, the shield officer shouting as he saw S. She was alone with her hands up. As I moved up now, I also saw her. Armed police, stay where you are now, hands on top of your head, I shouted, giving her an initial command. The officer with the taser behind me moved to my right, red dotting her with his taser. S lifted her hands onto her head, staying stationary. Interlock your fingers, I now instructed her. S interlocking her fingers, shuffling a bit. Right, slowly begin to walk towards us. If you make any sudden movements, you'll be tasered. Start walking when you're told. Can somebody with a launcher move up on our right, please, lads? I said, asking for somebody in the stack. The sixth officer in the stack, holding a launcher, now moved up onto the right of me and the officer with the taser. All right, cover on, he said, indicating he had a shot on her. Right, start walking. S began to take small steps towards us, her hand still on her head, looking straight at us. As she did this, the laser from the taser being pointed at her bounced around her torso. S was now four feet or so from us. Stop there. Turn around. S complied, stopping in her tracks, turning around. Walk backwards to the sound of my voice, slowly. S now began slowly walking backwards. As she did this, Adam moved up behind us, holding his cuffs. Stop there, I instructed S, as she was now pretty much right next to us. Adam moved the cuffs into our view to let us know he was about to move up and restrain her before moving between us up to her and restraining her. He then moved her back and out onto the street before returning back onto the stack. We advanced to the next door, as the room was cleared by the last three on the stack. As we moved up, we could see V on the floor. She did not appear to be injured, however was crying and clearly terrified. Stand up for us please, I said to her. V attempted to but clearly couldn't due to fear or shock or something of that nature, as a result of which we decided to take a more physical approach. The shield officer moved up, facing the right of the kitchen which was yet to be cleared. 
I held my carbine in an off-aim position near to V as the officer behind me helped her to her front and handcuffed her to her front before handing her off to Adam who took her outside. We then moved up, clearing the rest of the kitchen before walking back to the main room, stacking on the stairs. We then climbed the stairs, seeing three doors, one ahead and two behind us on a bend. The landing was very small and narrow. The shield officer pressed up to the left facing two doors behind us as two other officers and I followed. Meanwhile, three other officers cleared the room that was ahead and the rest held on the stairs. We approached the first door, which was found to be unlocked, as one of the officers in the stack moved and covered the other door. The shield operator opened the door, moving into the doorway, before moving further into the room. As he did this, I peeked right, and the officer behind me peeked left. Finding both corners to be clear, we then pressed further in, checking wardrobes and under beds and everything else. We then moved out and stacked on the second door on our side, also found to be unlocked. The shield officer opened the door, revealing a cupboard that was pitch black, at which point he activated the torch on his sidearm, revealing it to be clear. He moved as far as he could in, as we cleared the corners, before ensuring there was nobody hiding inside. We now turned over to the officers, who had found nothing in the other room, the bathroom, Property secure, lads, I said. OFC, update. Two detained, property secure, the OFC said into the radio. Yes, yes, that's received OFC, the TFC replied. We then went downstairs before exiting the property, splitting up. Adam picked up the discarded enforcer he used previously as we walked to our ARV. Adam stored the enforcer before taking his helmet and mask off. Meanwhile... I unloaded and stored my carbine and baton launcher. I then removed my contacts, mask, and gloves. TFC, all hotel units. Firearms authority rescinded, 2118, the TFC said, meaning we should store our equipment, which was already done. We then walked over to the OFC's ARV where the OFC, his crewmate, and two other officers were talking. We were quickly joined by the three other crews. One of the divisional sergeants came over to update us. Hello, lads. The subject is off to custody. The victim is with Ambo. She's safe and well. We're gonna get Soko to come over for a search. All right, mate. Thanks for the help. One of the officers replied before the sergeant walked off. Right. See you guys later. We're gonna clear off. I said to the group. Adam and I then walked back over to our ARV and left the scene finishing our shift. We later found out that S was convicted for her offense and was issued a two-year suspended sentence and was forced to attend an alcoholic treatment program. It was also revealed that the cause for the incident was domestic abuse. All right. I live in a major city in the south. It's a pretty big city, and as such, one finds themselves driving everywhere at all hours of the day. This is not an elaborate story, nor typically terrifying, but there's enough left unanswered that it still gives me the creeps to think about. It was around 1.30am, and I was driving home from a friend's house with my then-girlfriend, Allison. We'd been partying a bit, but as I was driving, I opted to maintain sobriety. Allison had a few drinks, but nothing serious and over the course of several hours. Now, the house I was leaving is not in a particularly bad neighborhood, but not a good one either. The city where I live, there are lots of gentrified areas where crack dealers live next to four-person families. It's a place where you are fine in the daytime, but you wouldn't want to be walking the streets alone late at night. Being familiar with the area, I decide to take a little cut through street. As I pull onto the street, I end up at a stop sign. I look behind me, and there's a truck that pulls out of an adjacent road behind me to my left. I move forward from the stop sign, and he continues to follow me. I think nothing of it. The road doesn't have many street lamps, so it's pretty dark, and I can't get a look inside the truck's cab. I drive about another 20 feet, 
and all of a sudden I see blue lights in my rearview mirror. Cop lights. Now I think, oh shit, not again. However, as I look into the rearview mirror, I notice several things that don't seem right. For one, there aren't many police trucks in the inner city area. Sure, there are some, but they're not common. Secondly, the police lights are not on top of the cab like a normal cop car, but next to the actual headlights by the grill, like a detective's car. I also notice there's an air freshener dangling from his rearview mirror. I've dealt with police officers on numerous occasions, but I've never seen one with a stereotypical pine tree freshener. Lastly, as I kept moving forward, slowly contemplating the situation, considering pulling over, I noticed the final strange variable. There is no police siren, no horn, no noise. It was late, it was dark, and I continued to drive slowly as I thought about all the odd factors. If I'd only noticed the first two factors, I think I may have stopped, but the fact that the blue lights kept flashing without any sirens was just off. I know in my state, it is legal to pull into a well-lit area at nighttime just for these circumstances. I decided that the air freshener, the position of the lights, and the lack of sirens was just too weird. I wasn't going to risk pulling over in a bad area, so I decided to move forward at around 20 miles per hour until I got to a gas station. The truck continues to follow me. There are a lot of speed bumps and road signs on this road. And thinking there's a possibility of a cop pulling me over, I abide by all the laws. The final straw that I determined made this truck a false police officer. He also obeyed all the traffic laws. When a cop wants to pull you over, you pull over. And if they don't, they aren't going to let you stop at a stop sign to let you get away. This guy stopped when I stopped, moved forward when I did and even turned as I decided to get to a more populated road. After about a hundred yards, he turns off his lights, both the blue lights and his main headlights. He takes a left behind me and peels away. It was at that moment I knew he was not a cop. I don't know exactly what I avoided that night. I drive a nice car, so it could have been a carjacking, but I don't rule out something worse. If it weren't for my ex-girlfriend's presence, I may have stopped. Ultimately, I'm just happy I didn't. This happened almost a decade ago when I was 13 years old. I remember my friend and I were excited about our first time trick-or-treating without our parents. We lived in a small town where nothing ever happens, and we thought it would be the same that night. It started like any other Halloween night. We collected candy, ran into many of our classmates, and had a lot of fun. At 8pm, we realized we had to head home, but on the way back, we dropped by our teacher's house. She wasn't home, and the street didn't have many street lights. To add to this, most of the houses had their lights turned off, and their Halloween decorations were taken down. My friend and I were slightly spooked and disappointed by the lack of candy. We wanted to get out of the street as soon as possible. That's when a man emerged from under one of the few street lights. It was a police officer. Neither of us seemed to notice him before this, possibly due to the darkness. He startled us, but seemed very friendly. The cop introduced himself and pointed to an inconspicuous bungalow. He said an older man living in this house was inviting trick-or-treaters inside. Someone called the police, but when he arrived, no one was answering the door. He kept telling us his police car and partner were just around the block. We looked around but couldn't see them. I was a pretty paranoid kid. Growing up, my mom loved watching crime shows, and she'd always tell me tidbits of lessons. One of these was a story about fake cops, although I don't remember the details. I remembered people can pretend to be police officers to gain trust. Throughout this whole exchange, I was terrified. His lack of badge, police car, and partner did not feel right. I was also conflicted because he was smiling and seemed like he just wanted to help. That was until we heard his strange request. 
He said he needed to speak to this potential predator and needed our help. Since we were young girls, the man would answer if we knocked. The officer claimed he would hide behind the bushes next to the front door. He would wait for him to invite us in, jump out, and catch him red-handed. At that moment, I knew my friend felt the same way I did. We both fell silent, but one of us managed to ask if we could discuss. The cop said yes, but told us we had limited time. The street was silent. He could hear everything. I remember feeling the way of wanting to say something, but fearing he would hear us and escalate the situation. We just stared at each other for what felt like forever. The cop was getting increasingly impatient and told us we had to decide quickly. Around that moment, a family came down the street and noticed the officer. They were coming over to see what was happening. That's when the cop said he'd be right back and did not go anywhere. My friend and I scrambled to collect our thoughts and decided to run away. We sprinted out of the street and didn't look back. On our way home, we discussed theories that ranged from him being a fake cop, him playing a prank on us, or him being a real cop but we misunderstood the situation. When we told our parents, we downplayed it a lot and doubted our experience. In the end, we didn't call the police, but our dads drove to that house and the area around the house. There were no cop cars or police officers in sight. Over the years, I can't say I regret not calling the police. At the time, my friend and I were convinced we misunderstood what was happening. We even told our class the next day and most, including our teacher, thought it was not alarming. Looking back, I find it extremely strange a police officer would put two children in such a potentially dangerous situation, moreover with our parents not present. I wonder what his motives were, but it will, unfortunately, remain unsolved. Hey guys, I hope you enjoyed that. If you have a scary story you would like me to read in an upcoming video, this is one way to help me guarantee variety in the stories I share. You can email me or post it to my subreddit. I'll drop the details in the video description. Thank you all for listening and a special thanks to my patrons and channel members who now have early access to ad-free videos as well as other behind-the-scenes content. Thank you to Jennifer J. Ashley Lilypad, Lee, Taya, Wyatt, Gina, Laura, JK06, Fenrizio, Donna, Joey, Big GSC, Tanya, Spaghetti Yolo King, Matthew, October Gypsy, Lisa, Ali, Thomas, Build With Me, Leticia, Fran, Debs, Insomnicats, Stephanie, Summer, Rebecca, Tyra, This Bad Kitty, Your Pappy's Dilly, Laney, Tripping Balls Through History, Samantha, Erica, Alyssa, Tracy, Killian's Place, April, James Arterburn, Jen, Joy, Handout, Pegasus Genesis, Karen Keating, V. Barry, LJ, Fiona X. Fox, Scott, I Like Booty, Monica Level Ace, Chris and Donna, Holly Spry, Kimber, Jasmine, Sanatix, Heather Haven, Kitty Cat Luna 2, ADHD Aurora, Janice, Cinderella Baby, Borderline Betty, Lady Dracoid, Erica Nicole, Snowball Rathena, Melanie, The Honeybee 987, Pretty Girl 215, Ryan, Brooke, Wendy, Crafty Kel, Tina, Dina, Vampy Debs, Patricia, Amber, Krista, Brenda, Absinthe Alice, Christy, Kay, Spider's Web, Ooh La La Andrea, Sue, Monique, Sean Gorman, Emma Lisa, 
Sigma Cube X, Greg, Chelsea, Amanda Jane, Sam, Zeb Tepe, Sarah C, Austin, Tegan, Lil Smart, Jenny, Gabrielle, Fire 05, Sarah P, James Gargano, Gemma Allen, Monica Level Ace, and Alex. I hope you're doing well, guys. I'll see you all on the next one.